middle of a dense, populated New York City street. I mean, it's a scary thing. Having weathered the storm of an economic crisis, these are grim days in the financial world, and a Category 3 hurricane. Authorities in New York City are now carefully watching a crane that is dangling from a high rise. Its sights are now firmly set on becoming the most desirable address on Earth. The lengths that we're going to, it's really unheard of. It's a luxury finish. Luxury doesn't come cheap. The top floor penthouse has already sold for over $90 million. Now that's a view. This is the tower New Yorkers have christened the Billionaire Building. Without question, there will be no other building like it. If you can afford it, it's a great place to live. It's called 157, and it's going to be the most luxurious skyscraper ever built. Super Skyscrapers was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Manhattan, some of the most expensive real estate in America. In a city full of skyscrapers, it's hard for a building to stand out. But this one might just do it. They've called it 157. It's a thousand feet of concrete, steel, and glass. And when complete, it will be the highest residential tower in the city. While the exterior is impressive, the interior promises to be nothing short of spectacular. If you want to live here, being merely rich will not be enough. The cheapest apartment will set you back over $6 million. A penthouse closer to $100 million. The man who had the original vision and borrowed $700 million to turn it into reality is former diamond dealer turned property magnate Gary Barnett. It's tough to assemble, you know, great pieces of land in New York City because the city's built. It's so not just not like you're expanding further out into the countryside or the desert or wherever. You, you've got to manufacture land. That means building tall. When complete, this skyscraper will boast a 30-story, five-star hotel. There'll be 94 no-expense-spared residential condominiums. The two penthouses will each occupy over 10,000 square feet of luxury living space. Above all, they'll look out over Central Park. It will be the most sought-after view in the city, and the job of 157 is to make it pay. I think my favorite definition of the skyscraper was by Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of the Woolworth Building who about 100 years ago said a skyscraper is a machine that makes the land pay. Bottom line, they're not built unless there is a financial proposition. The proposition is that luxury living, plus that view, plus an address on the street they're calling Billionaire's Row, will draw in the world's wealthiest buyers. It's the 2nd of April, 2013. 157 has been under construction for over four years. The first residents will move in in eight months' time. And that top floor penthouse has been snapped up for over $90 million. It's a new record for New York. Still, half of the building is as yet unsold. And if Gary Barnett is going to see a return on his massive investment, that will have to change. We actually formed a sales team from the beginning. On a building of this size, there are some significant commissions being paid. And we felt we wanted to take that in-house and, and, and be able to help our own cash flow. Today, they've gathered to learn about what may be the biggest challenge of their lives. We need to define a little bit better what the immediate needs are going to be. To reach $2 billion worth of sales by the end of the year. It's a big number and a big ask. But sales executive Emily Sertic seems to relish the challenge. I think any great salesperson absolutely wants to succeed. I don't think we'd be here if we didn't have that fire. And since it's hard to sell a luxury condominium when all you've got to show is construction work, the development team have tried to create, at their off-site sales gallery, a taste of what 157 will offer. It's a no-expense-spared, invitation-only sales experience. 
Don't expect to find any price tags in here. Our sales gallery is located in Midtown. We're here at Madison and 57. So come on in and I'll show you how we sell. In this space, we're defining location and everything that the location affords. It's very important that we place the building with its surrounding amenities in the city. Now, one thing about 157 that is entirely unique is our centered position on Central Park. It really sets the building apart. Now for details. What kind of kitchen goes into the world's most luxurious condo? Here, your seven-figure sum buys a choice of two. So the buyers can choose between this hand-painted white kitchen, or if we spin around and look over here, you have a Macassar ebony kitchen in a lacquer finish. You have two dishwashers, two refrigerators, two of the wall ovens. So if you really want to use your home to have large parties, you're in good shape. And our cabinetry is actually from the UK. And so you look in, this, in, the, cabinet, in the cabinets here and you have solid walnut. You can actually smell the, the, the beautiful smell of the wood here. This is one of the floors in the building. This uh, ripped sawn oak is done in an ebonized stain. But it's in the show bathroom that potential buyers first get to see the building's signature material, Italian marble. As you move up in the building, the finishes in the bathrooms um, take on a different look. So higher in the building, you have this statuary white marble. It's important to note that it's in very large slabs. Uh, this really uh, communicates the level of luxury in the design, and our buyers don't miss those points. It's a polished sales pitch. But what anyone considering buying here really wants to see is that view. An impossibility from a second floor sales center, or so you might think. The 157 team turned to Mark Siegel to solve the problem. He and his colleagues have built a drone that will fly amongst the towers of Manhattan in airspace where full-size helicopters simply could not reach. 760, 770, hold it right there. Fire and ready. Wonderful, 268 and coming, start up. GPS and a high-resolution camera enable them to capture the view from a building that hasn't even been built Beautiful. yet. Going for 570. Here at 482. Projected in the sales gallery, images from the 157 site take center stage. They sealed the deal on the penthouse sale. The view that everybody knows 1574 is the centered on Central Park view. There are literally no views like this in Manhattan. It's been clear from the start that this is the building's biggest selling point. Seen from the comfort of an apartment a thousand feet up. And if you're paying millions of dollars for this view, the last thing you want is dirty windows. It's April 3rd, and the workers are gearing up to put the building's roof in place. When they're finished, the whole skyscraper will be sealed beneath it. But before that can happen, one last piece of equipment, vital to the building's operation, must be installed. It's 30 feet long. It weighs 20 tons. And it's going all the way up to the roof. Because a ladder and a squeegee won't cut it here. This is what's needed to make sure 157's 8,400 windows are always crystal clear. In some of these apartments, you get a full wraparound, you know, New York City, uptown, downtown, towards uh, Brooklyn, Queens, and Jersey. It would be upsetting not to have these windows cleaned. Juan Portellis is responsible for what will be the Rolls Royce of window washers. A fully rotating telescopic crane that will lower a basket a thousand feet down a vertical wall of glass and enable a cleaning crew to keep those million dollar views spotless. $50 million for an apartment and my window's dirty, I'd definitely be upset. The rig's 24-piece telescopic boom will be assembled once it's safely on the roof. The team will then attach it to the heavy-duty base unit. This morning's task is to get this piece to the top of the skyscraper. And they can't afford any holdups. It is a good-looking building, that's for sure. 
But lifting a 20-ton piece of steel a thousand feet above Manhattan, just inches from a multi-million dollar glass curtain wall, is a highly risky operation. It's crane operator Kurt Messinger who's paid to feel the pressure. The challenge of hoisting any material, especially large materials, and the time it takes it to get up here, almost six minutes sometimes. A lot can happen in six minutes. It doesn't seem very long, but it can be an eternity. At this elevation, 1,100 feet, it could be calm down in the street. But up here, you'll have winds exceeding 20, 25 miles an hour just on a nice day. The vortices, as they come around through the buildings, they'll take that material, that load, and they'll start moving it left and right, spinning it. It's good when it's good, but when things go wrong, it can get ugly. All right, the piece is coming up, boys. Let's go. For the next six minutes, Juan can do nothing more than watch. As the boom leaves the shelter of the surrounding buildings, it's exposed to the full force of the wind, which is swirling around the tower. All right, yo, Frankie, well on, let's go. This is where Kurt's skills and his years of experience really come into play. Just like that is where we need it. With the boom at the desired height, the trick now is to bring it across to the building without inducing a potentially lethal swing. Motor goes to the front. Motor goes to the front. Willow. Frankie, grab that rope with him. Watch that. Watch a cross member. Right, just hold it steady and he'll do the rest. Nice and easy, nice and easy. Everybody good? Oh, yeah. Everybody on deck. 20 minutes after it left the ground. Oh, that's gonna be beautiful. The boom sits safely on the skyscraper's roof. Frankie, just break off the back one too. You got a young man, beautiful job there. What follows is two days of reassembling the boom arm before the main event, attaching it to the base unit. It's 48 hours after the big lift. Today, Juan's team will attempt to complete the rig installation. What's going on, John? But there's been a worrying development. There's a storm coming. Storms and cranes don't mix. No one knows that better than the people working on 157. On October 29, 2012, Hurricane Sandy tore through New York. Winds of over 80 miles an hour battered the city, and 157 and its crane found themselves in the direct path of the hurricane. Subjected to its full force, the crane's 26,000-pound boom was snapped in half, leaving it hanging perilously over the streets below. Authorities in New York City are now carefully watching a crane that is dangling from a high-rise in Manhattan. It collapsed in high winds earlier today, and it has been dangling precariously, dangerously, off the top of that building, which has become known in Manhattan as the Global Billionaires Club. I mean, the hurricane wasn't part of the package. That was a scary episode um, when, you know, the crane uh, fell over backwards. Luckily, it did not disconnect. One of the good things we saw is that this building stood up to a hurricane and getting smacked by a crane boom and didn't budge. So we know it's a pretty darn strong building. What project manager Juan Portellis knows is that he has just a matter of hours to get the job finished and the boom arm secure. Every night it's soft sleeping, just keeping the thoughts of uh, this piece going up and you know making everything safe for everybody. You're uh, basically trying to get a round cylinder through a hole and you're using a crane to try to line you up so we can get the pin in. So it's very challenging. The thing is that they gotta go, they gotta go down and rig it right now. On the roof of the skyscraper, Juan's team reconnects the boom arm to the crane's super strength hook. Start doing what you gotta do up there. And the 20 ton boom is eased off the ledge. But as the crane operator carefully maneuvers the rig towards the base unit, the storm is closing in faster than anyone here predicted. 
Right now, we got a, a storm approaching, and uh, we've got to go ahead with the, uh, the final installation of the arm. We have no other choice but to get everything connected. Uh, it actually looks like it's going to start pouring like any minute now, and uh, we're just going to have to suck it up and just stay out there and just get soaked till we secure everything. Hold that right there, Angel. As the rain gets heavier, the team now faces a race against time to guide the boom arm into position. Until it's secured within the base tower, the crane must continue to bear its massive weight. You got to do it from down there. Make sure the flange is on the outside. But that's not the team's only concern. They have to get the window washing rig disconnected from the crane before the storm hits. If the two are still anchored to each other, the force of the wind on the crane could rip the entire structure from the building. At this point, we have no choice. We have to work with the weather. You know, we have to move quickly and safely as possible to try to get this secured onto the uh, unit itself. Once it's secured, the crane can release itself and we should be okay. Yeah, the inside, take that off. That was just there to help you line it up. Yeah. The last piece of the puzzle is a 100 pound pin, which must join the arm and the base together. Easier said than done from a cherry picker hanging a thousand feet above Manhattan. No, we got grease in there. We got a ton of grease. <laughs> Finally, after 45 minutes, it's time to hammer it into position. Go, go, go! Hey, 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 right there, you can hear it. Oh, we've yeah. met already. <laughs> For Juan, this is the culmination of eight weeks planning. It's like a ton off my chest. I know now it's secured. I can walk away from the, from the job for today and not worry about anything. The machine is secure up on the roof. Juan can now sleep at night, and the residents of the billionaire building will get the view they paid for. Now it's about what happens inside. If the team is to deliver the world's most opulent building, one key member has a battle on his hands. Three days later, and 4,000 miles away from Manhattan, in Carrara, Italy, Roy Kim, Gary Barnett's senior vice president of design, is on a mission. He has to sign off on an order of marble worth tens of millions of dollars. He placed the order one year ago. Since then, they've been stockpiling slabs to complete 94 bathrooms in the skyscraper. Roy will not leave until he has seen and approved every single piece that's been extracted and set aside from this world-famous quarry. We've arrived in Carrara, and we're just kind of beginning the hunt for the great white marble. We're here to see the statuary that we'll be using specifically for the very large master bathrooms. When it comes to marble, it doesn't get more prestigious or pricey than this. It's been that way for a good 2,000 years. Ancient Rome was built from Carrara marble. Michelangelo's David carved from Carrara marble. Now Gary Barnett wants it for the walls, floors, and tubs of 157, whatever the cost might be. This one block alone is worth half a million dollars. Postage not included. When we decided to make the, the master bathrooms out of this stone, we knew it would be expensive, but we also knew we were building a very expensive building. And it's not often you see a 30 foot by 12 foot bathroom in the middle of the sky overlooking Central Park in Manhattan. Having had the obligatory tour, it's time to get down to business. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Any slabs that fail to meet Roy's strict criteria, from the clarity of the marble to the thickness of the famous gray veins, will be rejected. Or Roy will have Gary Barnett to answer to. Stone is of particular interest to him because he comes from the diamond industry. 
but also he just has a really, really sharp eye for material. These laser eyes focuses in on the background color on the, on the veining and, and that type of thing. And so those eyes kind of trickle down to all of us. What about in here? Are there, are there any more of that? This is the darkest I would accept for the background. It would be preferable if the veining were stronger. A lot of these things you cannot judge by photograph, so you need to come in person and look at all the imperfections. I'm not in love with it. This is not good. Uh, that's not good. I mean, all of these are, are really not good. It appears Roy's criteria have not been matched. And he's not a man to accept second best. We push the, melon. the production's labs obviously are not matching uh, the record's level right. that this was our target. The lab we are matching it was filled on a year ago. It was filled on a year ago, but we, I, uh, during that time, I identified bundles to purchase. So we thought you were purchasing those bundles and you didn't purchase those bundles. We try and be as specific as possible about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and they keep trying to push outside the lines. After three more hours, Roy has had enough. He demands to speak to the boss, quarry owner Manrico Gimignani. He didn't ask me to talk to you. He did not ask me to talk to you. I, I came to you. Yeah, my opinion. No, no, he didn't. They have always been very respectful of, of you guys. They really have been. This is now the last chance for Roy and the quarry owner to secure a multi-million dollar deal. I mean, it's just basically pushing and pushing and pushing to try and get the best. But Roy's sky-high standards are proving almost impossible to meet. The expectation of Roy is very high, it's very high, because he wants good vein, not uh, spotting, clean white, no crack, too many conditions <laughs> for a natural material, but I understand. I've lost count how many times we've been here and argued over what's acceptable and what's not, so it's this game. As Roy stands his ground, Manrico is left with no alternative but to let him loose to cherry pick from his multi-million dollar stash. Pushed and pushed to get really beautiful stone, and I think we're almost there. This is beautiful. Uh, this is all within the acceptable range. Can I see one with, uh, like, in the sunlight? There we go. Wow, that's good. Finally satisfied with his selection, Roy can focus on the most important part of his visit. One after the other. These blocks. Four meter long. We do two tops and two benches on and off I see. Oh, yeah. They're worth upwards of $130,000 each. And from each one will come just two bathtubs and two ornate benches. He'll take five. A block like this, which is 35 tons, is worth about 100,000 euros. It's a lot of money. It's a bit of a challenge because the blocks are raw. So we have no idea what's inside. So we're taking a bit of a risk. It's even a... Wow. Marble. You can see the difference in the marble here in the bright sunlight and in the shadow. You can see just right away that the veining is, is quite amazing and the color is going to be amazing. Blocks chosen. Over the next 16 weeks, they'll be shaped, carved, polished, and smoothed. When Roy next sees this marble, it will be in New York and look very different. He'll then be in possession of some of the most expensive bathroom fixtures ever made. It's kind of a miracle. <laughs> I, I, I need a, a very strong drink. It's been like a gargantuan task for the past two years to try and get um, the stone that, that we wanted. And, and I think, I don't want to speak too soon because we may be missing like a few thousand square feet, but it, we're, we've pretty much got what we need. It's just nine days since the team's targets were set, and four more apartments have been sold for a total in excess of $100 million. But everybody wants more, and there's a plan in place to make it happen.
to fast track one of the residences inside the skyscraper and show buyers exactly what's for sale. You know what? Um, I have had so much demand, so much request from uh, brokers uh, and their clients uh, asking to get to the site. They need to see the views for themselves. I think we're at the in-between stage where it's now time to give the clients and the brokers that sort of experience. The completed experience. Yeah. So we'll have to select the top interior designer to finish out the space. I think if we're going to do this, we have to make sure that this is a finished experience. From the time you get off the elevator, the corridor is done, you step into the model and you really get the impression of what it's like to live there. So we can't do this halfway. This has to be a, a terrific model apartment. Let's do it. The man to make it all happen? Brian McGrath, 157's project manager. It's now his job to turn this 41st floor construction site into an apartment worthy of a $19 million price tag. He's been given just four weeks to do it. And though the plan is to dress it with rich furnishing and fine art, right now, it needs walls. So you can see this is where we've started framing. Now once the framing goes in, it sort of opens everything up. And you get the feel of what's gonna be in these apartments now because everything's laid out. This is where the walls are gonna be. This is gonna be a kitchen. Island will be here. Uh, you've got your stoves there. That's where the gas comes in. You've got outlets in the backsplash. Brian has been involved in every aspect of 157's construction from the ground up. His job is all about hitting deadlines. But this one is gonna be tight. It means doing in four weeks what might normally take four months. We know that it's such a powerful sales tool to be able to bring people to a physical site. It's such a powerful experience and it accelerates the sales process. The deadline in terms of sales is it can never be early enough. As work on the model residency gets underway in New York, 3,000 miles away in a sleepy town in Wiltshire, England, a team of craftsmen is chipping away at an order of handmade kitchens for the skyscraper. Gary Barnett believes these men make the best kitchens in the world. You have these high-end top apartments in New York City. That's all being built by a small furniture firm in Wiltshire. This small company has gained global recognition for producing custom-made, one-off kitchens. Gary Barnett likes them so much, he's ordered 135, and he wants them yesterday. Right, here are all the doors you've seen being laid out is for the new development that we've got going on in New York. But you notice we've got them all laying out because the way they're actually constructed is that the ebony is all book matched. So you have a repetition of the ebony veneers going along the full length of the cabinet run itself. You've got to get it spot on because if you can't just lose one panel through to a wrong size specification or the hinge is put in the wrong place because that will then ruin the whole run. 135 kitchens, of which there's about 18 different layouts. Had to be luxurious. Um, but actually, I think as you can see, it's a luxurious finish. Luxury doesn't come cheap. That's because it takes time. We are bespoke. We make one kitchen after another. We don't make blocks of kitchens. So that was a new, that's a change of direction for us. Each cabinet door takes 16 weeks to make. And this order is for three and a half thousand they've had to find a way to mass produce masterpieces. They basically said to us, right, we need these seven kitchens and we want them, we send a container over next Tuesday. We need them on there. So then it's all, it's hands on two different worlds, isn't it? <laughs> In Manhattan. Spring in New York. Two weeks after the decision was made to create a model residence within the skyscraper, Roy Kim and the development team have sprung a site visit to inspect progress. The model residency apartment is a really nice three bedroom apartment that's on the 41st floor. And the 41st floor compared to the 90th floor might not seem that spectacular, but the view is amazing. Right now it's April 23rd. 
and we're trying for the uh, first or second week of May to open this. So this is the crunch time. Towards the end, there's a mad rush to kind of get all the finished items in and the furniture and the art. And that's what's going to happen in the next two weeks. So this is the first time that I'm actually seeing this kitchen built, and it's pretty amazing. This fridge is like there's two of them. It's a, it's a little insane. Stools going here, we've got more storage here. Five different cooktops over there. Huge sink with two dishwashers. It's, it's a serious kitchen. While the kitchen might be taking shape, the rest of the apartment is still a long way off completion. Roy knows that if the deadline is not met, they risk losing millions of dollars in sales. In, in that room, it's in that room. Just in that room, what about here? Maybe in the, and, and they haven't even rough sanded here yet. Is there a way to get the guys um, who are doing the foyer and also any of the wallpapering to get them in before the Monday? I really would yeah. advise them off. In less than two weeks, this apartment must not only be beautifully decorated, but furnished to create the illusion that it's a billionaire's home. That means dressing it with contemporary works of art, loaned from New York's most exclusive galleries. I don't think I can get it before the sixth year because there it needs to be uh, created and the crates need to be made. And it's already really tight for the creators to actually make the crates and everything for the six. Just to move it here. Because they, you know, they know this still the building is a construction site. If it was maybe going to a finished space or an apartment or residence, maybe not. But regardless, well, but, but pushing it him. so that we can get here and everything up for the date being the seventh. Well, exactly. The, the, yeah. For the opening being on the seventh uh -huh. and yeah. not the ninth. For mm -hmm. pushing up for the seventh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know we can do it. We've done this in much less time. I mean, we have literally built a sales center that looked like it would never open, and it opened the next day to rave reviews. Without giving any warning, Roy has just brought the completion date forward by two days to May the 7th. The deadline has gone from being tight to being seriously tough. But that's one of the hallmarks of this build. Since it was first conceived, Plans for 157 have only become more ambitious. We thought maybe we'd build, you know, a two or 300,000 square foot residential building. We didn't have the ambitions or the, you know, or the foresight to see what it would eventually become. And tall buildings are not only complicated to build, but they're very expensive. But given that the market was moving up in 05, 06, 07, quite sharply, we felt that the numbers made sense and to go ahead with this project. What no one foresaw was what came next, the economic slump of 2008. Gary's plans were not immune from the turmoil that followed. Share prices continued to tumble in the aftermath of the Lehman collapse. Are we headed for a worldwide recession or something even worse? These are grim days in the financial world. You know, we got caught with the downturn five years ago and there was no financing to be had to build a building like this. Um, it was a challenge. Undeterred, he scoured the globe for investors. It took two years to put the pieces in place, but the plan that emerged was bigger and bolder. He chose the award-winning architect Christian de Portsempart to design the building, and it now towers over every other residential skyscraper in New York. Building a thousand-foot-tall tower in the middle of a dense, populated New York City street, I mean, it's a scary thing, but that's how great cities get built. There's no way around it. We're not building in the desert where if something falls, it doesn't matter. You know, here it matters. And we do everything we can to prevent it. This is a building that took five years to build. Smaller building, smaller building might have taken two and a half or three years. The extra time is more risk, more exposure, more interest costs. The extra size of the building makes it much more expensive to build. Actually, there are not that many people ready to do it because it's risky, because it's long term, because you have to put out a lot of cash. So we've been fortunate to, to be successful and to be able to continue doing that. It's the 4th of May. Time to see where those hundreds of millions of dollars went. On the 41st floor of 157, the team is working around the clock to complete the model apartment on time. With just three days to go until the planned unveiling, there's still a catalog of work to undertake. Yes, this, this one's very tough <laughs> because there's nothing to grab onto. Yeah. And 38 floors below, the pressure is also on to complete another of the skyscraper's signature rooms. 
It's the lobby of the luxury hotel that will occupy the first 30 floors of 157. Offering guests and residents the full five-star treatment 24 hours a day. Tonight, site foreman Jim Callahan will mastermind the delicate operation of installing nine $100,000 steel architectural panels into the marble-clad lobby. They're too large to fit through any door, so Jim's team will have to winch each eight-foot panel through a gap in the building's curtain wall that's just three feet wide. We're dealing with a 3,200-pound item, and we have to act like it's a one-pound item. I mean, with the finesse that we have to do, everything is damageable, everything costs a lot of money, and there is nothing we can even scratch, nick, dent, or break. It's, it has to be pristine. Jim's challenge hasn't been made any easier by a requirement to conduct the entire operation at night. The DOB in New York City has only allowed us uh, a permit Saturday night. I have uh, a lot of lighting to cover all the areas that we're going to be working around. We have to shut down four lanes of 57th Street, which is a two-way crossing street. And whenever the public is involved, there's an extra stress on pedestrian and public safety. For sure. These people come by, a little belligerent, had a few drinks. You know, they know where we work. We're representing our union, right? Make everyone proud. It's 8 p.m. A truck carrying $800,000 worth of stainless steel panels awaits unloading outside 157. With four lanes of traffic closed and the general public cleared from the lift zone, Jim's first task is to guide the mobile crane into position. With its telescopic boom extended, the rigging crew can now commence connecting the crane to the panels. From his position four floors up, Jim gives the order to lift. And the first $100,000 panel is slowly raised from the trailer and guided towards the curtain wall window, 40 feet above. It's now critical that the panel is kept under total control by the crane operator and Jim's highly trained tagline team. Any contact between the steel load and the glass curtain wall will result in damage costing thousands of dollars. It's a tense moment as the first panel is inched through the gap. And finally, guided safely into the building. Now inside, it can be raised into position and fixed to the lobby ceiling. But this is just the first of eight architectural panels that need to be installed. $800,000 of polished steel hung in a single night. This is the end result. Everything worked out fine. We had absolutely zero incident in uh, completing. We have zero punch list. Everything is perfect. I'm um, very happy with the finished product, very happy. And I believe everyone here is as well. It's May the 7th, 2013. D-Day for Brian McGrath and his team. They were given only four weeks to complete the ultimate model residence inside 157. But they've done it. Working around the clock, they've created a custom-fitted three-bedroom apartment, boasting over 3,000 square feet of luxury living space. And they've done it in the middle of a building that is still under construction, with floor-to-ceiling windows offering unobstructed views over Manhattan, a handmade kitchen from England, and the finest marble from Italy, it's yours for $19 million. Now the sales team will get the opportunity to show it to the brokers, the vital link between sellers and buyers. If the brokers like what they see, it will open 157's doors to the richest buyers on the planet.
when you have an iconic building like this and you want to expose it to the world, you want to invite buyers to come in directly and brokers to bring in all their great clients. We have such an extraordinary, eclectic uh, overview of, of people from all different lifestyles, nationalities and cultures interested in Manhattan. It is one of the supreme global brands. We work with wealth management advisors, we work with bankers, we work with sports agents, with Hollywood agents, and when something as exciting as this comes on the market, the brokers are hitting that Rolodex hard because, as you can imagine, there's big commissions involved with big sales. So welcome to Residence 41A. We're very excited to have you in as one of our first to be able to actually see a fully furnished model residence. This is our three bedroom residence. I've been waiting 18 months to get inside. I this know building. you have. I almost feel like I need my sunglasses in here. Uh, it's so, so bright. Drama you promised and drama you've delivered. Very good. This is one of the things I was really excited to see. What is it going to be like to have floor to ceiling glass? I have to tell you, it doesn't disappoint. <laughs> Extraordinarily surprised. Thank God my clients will love it. <laughs> I have to see these views at night. Not a problem. We're ready for uh, entertaining. <laughs> we'll be here a while. <laughs> okay. Come on into the kitchen. Many of these buyers will never spend time in the kitchen. They'll have someone cooking for them, or they'll be entertaining and having caterers here. Let me take you into the master bedroom. This will be a beautiful way to wake up in the morning with eastern light coming in. And I never have to worry about my view being blocked. <laughs> exactly. Take off with the view. That's uh, right. Probably. I'm not going to exaggerate on this, but I think it's probably the best bath view in all of Manhattan. Right now, um, new developments are the engine that is currently driving the Manhattan market. I would say that this project, 157, is the Ferrari out of the gate in this engine of opportunity. Everything's a big deal when you're talking about these kind of big numbers, and nobody's going to walk out of here disappointed. Now it's down to the brokers to tell their super rich clients what they've seen and convince them to spend big in the billionaire building. Four months have passed since the model apartment opened. New York's highest residential skyscraper is now almost fully enclosed under glass. the very top of the building. We're enclosed on all four sides now. Uh, and this is, a, this is a big point in the building, because once we get enclosure, that means that we can start thinking about taking the crane down. So once we're done setting these panels and the crane comes down, the only way to get to the outside of the building is from this window washing rig. But as the last of the roof panels are installed, 87 floors below in the hotel lobby, the scene of that intense all-night operation, there's a noticeable absence of some highly polished architectural steel panels. The owner actually came through after all of our hard work in bringing these screens in and actually walked in here and on a whim asked us to remove three of them after they were all finished and installed. I don't know, uh, $150,000 uh, lost on each screen at the wave of uh, guys' hands saying, I didn't like them, there was too many. After all of that design, thought, input, you know, just throw away $450,000. Uh, unbelievable. Today, five months after his trip to Italy, Roy Kim will oversee the delivery of one of his two-ton bathtubs sculpted from a single block of Italian marble. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. Um, the tub has arrived on site. It came here without a glitch. Um, I'm super, super, super excited. It's a little bit like Christmas. It's been sculpted, crated, and shipped 4,000 miles. Now the tub faces one last journey, 800 feet up to the 80th floor have to rotate it onto its side in order to bring it up. And hopefully it comes up in one piece. Until the condominium is ready for it to be installed, the tub will remain in its crate. But after a five month wait, Roy cannot resist taking a peek inside. This uh, tub costs in the six figure range. It's a, it's a very expensive tub. If the quality is not to our standards, we won't accept it. So 
so this is it. It looks great. It looks fantastic. The veining is fantastic. It was worth all the pain and the effort to get it here, to get the quality. You know, it's, it looks amazing. It's going to look good in the space. Fantastic. It's hard to judge a $100,000 tub when it's wrapped in plastic, but Roy likes what he sees. This is how I thought it would look. What do you think, Rocco? Looks good. Great. Worth the pain? Almost, almost worth all the pain. Undecided. We'll have to think. We'll have to see the rest of the project. Three days later, Juan Portellas is heading back to the roof of the skyscraper to check up on his window washing rig. When he was last here, his machine was exposed to the elements. Now it's fully enclosed under an electronically operated sliding glass roof. Today, he'll carry out the first test run of the machine that can lower a window cleaning basket down a 1,000 foot wall of glass, ensuring the city's newest skyscraper dazzles. You want to shake out any bugs, anything that the machine can possibly go wrong. Every switch is working the way it's supposed to cut off when it's supposed to. It should be smooth sailing. Two of my uh, fellow workers, they'll be the first ones on it. But they're, they've been here with me putting it together, so they'll be comfortable with it. That's our next step. Juan's work on the most sophisticated window cleaning rig ever constructed is almost complete but he's not ready to walk away just yet. Every machine that we put up, somehow I always make my way back, make sure the, the loving, tender care that I put in to put it in is continuing after I leave. They're basically my, my little kids, <laughs> and I'm taking this one close to heart. This machine can be seen from anywhere in New York City right now, Queens, Brooklyn, New Jersey, we had the machine out, and uh, we uh, had several helicopters in the area, and that night, it actually came out in the news. Nobody has a clue what it's for. This thing looks like a rocket launcher, ready to shoot out a missile. Very high profile. It's a high profile building with a high profile machine. It's December. Just eight months ago, the 157 sales team were set the ultimate challenge to achieve a target of $2 billion in sales. After an extensive push and with help from a lavish sales gallery, a state-of-the-art drone helicopter, Fire and, ready. and a multi-million dollar show apartment, now that's a view. They've smashed through their $2 billion target, and they still have a quarter of the residences in hand. I'm never happy till we're completely sold, but we're extremely um, happy with the progress, and our team is always looking forward to the next sale. I think the fact that we're so well sold uh, not only makes it a good investment, too, but it also is a tribute to, to the fact that, you know, people do view this building as a great building. In New York, Speculation is rife as to exactly who will be moving into the multi-million dollar apartments. But their identities remain a secret, closely guarded by the team behind the super skyscraper. In the past, people were just looking for a home with four walls in a proper location that worked for their lifestyle. They're now looking for masterpiece design. This property delivers it. To look up at a building and to say, I sold over $2 billion of real estate, it's a feeling of accomplishment, and it kind of motivates me to go on to the next. One day, maybe I'll be able to afford to come over here and uh, have a dinner with my...